Hey, welcome back, everyone, to our second lecture on PC314 Media and Technology in Ministry. We're going to move forward. We had interesting discussion on Chapter 4 earlier class. So let's move into Chapter 5 now. Um, yeah. But we want to talk about the gathering place, how this has changed and what we are seeing happen. And we'll discuss. Here again, I just want to you know, kind of lead us, uh, us to have a little discussion, just for people to share their thoughts. So let's go back to Bible times, right? Um, when the Lord Jesus ministered, or in, in the, let's, let's, as he's talked about the New Testament times, things were revolving around the temple and the synagogue. So that used to be the place people used to gather, and they would hear the reading of the scripture and sing psalms and hymns. Uh, that used to be, uh, they would bring their offerings and sacrifices and so on. Then the church was born. Uh, their preaching happened, you know, in the public, you know, from the upper room. Uh, you can imagine Acts chapter 2, preaching from the upper room. It was all out on the street. Uh, Peter preached the gospel. People got saved. And they were meeting in Solomon's Court, which, which is a place in the temple uh, where they were preaching. And uh, when Paul would go, he would typically go into the synagogues where the gathering, the Jews would gather, and he would try to present the message of Jesus. Uh, and eventually, of course, uh, the numbers had increased so much where people were meeting from house to house. Right? So that's what we see in Acts chapter 2. People are meeting house to house. They had the big gathering. They came in a gathering in Solomon's porch, but they also had these house meetings. Just people gathering home, house to house, sharing, praying, fellowshipping, having bread together, so on. So that continued for a long time. Um, and then we see the transition uh, to these big church buildings. And uh, a lot of it uh, took place around uh, 400 uh, AD. The term. This was when uh, the Emperor Shalman, Shalman himself had an experience with Jesus. The, he began to support the church. And uh, so lands and buildings were built, uh, you know, to promote um, Christianity as such. And that's when all these big cathedrals, big buildings started coming. So that went on for many, many hundreds of years. Typical church building would be a big building with steeple and altar and all of those things. Uh, it was nice in one sense that there was a place for people to gather. Um, there was a sense of awe and reverence. Um, there was order and so on. And uh, as things moved on, uh, somewhere in the uh, you know the the early part of uh, or towards the 1950s, when there were the the the, the, the the tent revivals and the big uh, revivals of healing evangelists, preaching in tents, gospel was out. Gospel was being preached under tents, it was being preached in the open fields, big crusade meetings. And around that same time, there was a transition from uh, people sort of fine meeting in, you know, buildings that didn't look like typical church buildings. They would rent out, you know, uh, halls, auditoriums, uh, just you know, uh, regular places and meet there. So uh, this, this this shift happened, you know, I guess around the 1970s and so on. So you would have a lot of teaching centers, you know, word center, faith center, worship center, all these centers being uh, established. Of course, different, different names were given, uh, but that started happening. And then from there, uh, as these, Centers grew, they would buy big lands, huge lands, big, put up big buildings. And these buildings just necessarily didn't look like the traditional church building. They would, it was more like a big auditorium type. 
uh, high tech auditorium with all you know uh, big screen and all those kinds of things so the shift happened you know you went from traditional church buildings to teaching centers from teaching centers you went to these big auditoriums gathering places that had all all the you know all the high tech things inside and uh, then you know uh, there were times so again in the gathering place you try to imagine in the early church when people got together nobody had bibles and nobody had hymn books and song books nothing they just got together uh, uh, somebody had a scroll they could read but other everybody didn't have they preached the message and they would sing songs that they had learned you know in a, in a communal way then came these church buildings where then slowly with the printing press and all we had hymn books or song books and everybody had a hymn book that you could we could sing together of course it helped but that became focus and then as this teaching center started developing those those days there were the overhead projectors you know so there was a shift moving away from uh, everybody holding a hymn book to people looking at something projected on the screen uh, the, of course, the benefit was everybody could lift hands, the hands were free, they could lift hands, they could clap hands, they could express more. And then you come into these big auditoriums these days, where you have LED screens, you have PowerPoint, and uh, very, very you know, enter engaging audiovisuals. Uh, so it's almost like you're entering a movie theater or something, you know, you have all these big screens and all that okay it has its advantages because now you can not only hear the preaching of the word you can see visuals you can see the lyrics and all of those things it has advantages but that's you know what we're seeing these days and um, i mean if you go to this website uh, stage design ideas you go there and you look at all the different kinds of what's happening on stage you know so before there was some sacredness and altar space from where the preacher would preach and uh, there was a sacred place where prayer from which prayer would be made now that space has changed so much it's uh, uh, you know it's it has uh, lighting it has instruments it has uh, all kinds of designs you know to... so things have changed so much from where places where people gather and then again we had some very drastic change when technology came in and we are talking about media and technology and media and technology now began to have a part in this whole service so now the service could actually be streamed live to other locations you know so people started or churches pastors and it's happening all over the world they started having satellite locations now uh, 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 most probably um, now part of this also started from the tent revival so i think the first person to do this at least in known history uh, was oral roberts where uh, when he had his tent meetings he would uh, he had he was the first person to use um, cameras uh, in the in his tent meetings and it would go live on television so that people around the united states could actually participate in what was happening in that healing crusade revival under the tent so he kind of pioneered that and that came into uh, the Sunday morning service, where of course the Sunday morning service would go on live on radio and then later on live on television. You know. uh, so people could sit at home and watch the Sunday service. And then with the internet, and, and, and Yonggi Cho used that pretty well. So in the 19, uh, mid 1960s, or I think in the 1970s, even when Yonggi Cho in, in Seoul, Korea, uh, set up one location. He actually connected many locations through uh, television, TV monitors. So this is how he could have thousands of people listening to him preach. So he used it very well. 
uh, they, they had many other locations and he, he was kind of pioneered uh, the replication of Sunday service and from one location to other locations. Now, his, the, the, mo the motivation there was because everybody couldn't fit into one auditorium. They had multiple auditoriums and these were connected by television and people would watch in the other auditoriums, but they all came at the same timing and they participated. And then with the internet, uh, churches began to stream live and open branches in other places. I mean, it doesn't have to be in the same vicinity. It doesn't have to be in the same city. It could be in the city or it could be in other cities. So the pastor is preaching in one place. They have a congregation there. That same message is streamed live to, you know, maybe two, three, four other locations. <clears throat> People are there and the satellite churches are there and people are participating in or listening to the same pastor, the same message in other cities, sometimes in other parts of the world. So you have these live streamed satellite churches. Right? Then along with that, and especially during the pandemic and even before that actually, um, people started connecting to services online from home because now technology, everything was very easily available. You can sit at home, connect your laptop, you watch the service at home. And so people started forming these, uh, you know, groups or home groups or church groups in, in homes and so on. And, um, and it's happening all over the world, but some of the churches that are doing, uh, using it a lot, uh, I've just mentioned here, Life Church, I think is probably the biggest, uh, number in terms of number of churches that are that are satellite churches and live stream churches connected so they probably are, are the largest maybe um in in terms of numbers um there's elevation church uh, again based in north america uh, there's kingdom city uh, uh, they're from australia and they're spread across in different countries so that's very interesting because uh, they connect across our countries as well so uh, the whole thing has changed so much where um, the pastor is preaching one place and people are sitting in other parts of the world connected to that service, listening, and so on. And there are pros and cons to all of this, right? So I want us to think about, you know, what are the what is the good, what is the what is the good and the bad, and what should be avoided? You know, okay, technology has come, media has come. It has become part of the church service, which in Bible times they didn't have. Even 700 years ago, they didn't have it. And here we are in a day and time when media and technology is so much part of a church service, so much part of a church ministry. And uh, we are reaching globally. Wonderful. We are able to reach many people in many parts of the world other languages, so it's wonderful. But, uh, you know, what are the pros and the cons? We shouldn't forget that there could be downsides to all of this. And also, what are some of the things we must avoid? So in what is happening in today's contemporary church, in the way people are gathering and in the way people are being connected through technology, media technology, what are the pros and cons? Uh, what is the good and the bad? And what are some of the things we should uh, try to address and avoid is something I would like to hear. Uh, we can discuss and share our thoughts. So please feel free, just like we did in the last um, chapter. Uh, share your thoughts on you know how media technology has affected and changed the way we gather and the way we worship together. Um, your thoughts on that. Uh, one of the things I can think of is, um, so even though we are able to reach many people uh, who does not even have access uh, to a church, physical church, but it has also given rise to a celebrity culture. Mm. And uh, that is quite dangerous. And there's no one to correct uh, in that area. The people fall prey to that. and. Uh, it has been seen in uh, many areas. Um, yeah, that is one thing which I just want to point out. 
Mm. Celebrity culture. That is so true. And I, I don't know why that has happened, you know, where uh, on the one hand, it's a good thing that, you know, okay, if one church is able to stream live and go to many places, but I don't know why in the result, the past has become such a celebrity. I don't know, but it has happened. And what you're saying is true. Uh, yeah. And uh, we have to be careful. Important point. Okay. Please feel free to share anyone else. How media and technology has affected the gathering place, the way people gather and worship together. Go ahead, Divya. Go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Pastor. Um, I think um, uh, we started seeing a lot of changes with the pandemic. Uh, happening uh, it uh, I I hear like people saying uh, church is not a building it is the people um, that make the body of Christ um, at the same time um, uh, at, uh, what it says in Hebrews 10 25 like uh, we need to gather uh, we need to spur each other and encourage all those those aspects of fellowship was really uh, being missed, I would say. Um, yes, uh, there is scope of some kind of fellowship, uh, especially during um, COVID times. I remember like uh, people from different locations, they could come uh, in a Zoom meeting. There are, of course, many you know, ministries that uh, cropped up during those uh, times. Um, so people from different locations could join together. And uh, there is fellowship, yes, um, especially in Zoom meetings, I would say, like small groups. Um, but there's no tangible fellowship. Uh, like the, you don't really see and uh, mm -hmm. experience what the other person is going through and all that. Also, um, uh, uh, the other thing that is, um, I feel, is an advantage of such uh, 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 online services and all that is th those who do not have access, like old people or disabled people who really, they want to attend the service, are able to at least attend uh, an online service. So that uh, that's uh, good in a uh, way. Um, another thing which I could uh, think of is, would be missing is, uh, mentoring part or the discipleship that needs to happen uh, mm. would not happen um, in in if we are doing the online and using media mostly for these things yeah yeah these are some mm. things i feel yeah sure, sure. good thank you for sharing that anything else how media and technology has affected the way we gather the way we Worship together, fellowship together. Is it good, bad? What should we be careful about? Um, so about, so about satellite, satellite churches. churches. So, so is it like the pastor just live streams? The same pastor speaks everywhere, even though he's not there. Is it like that? I just want to know about what that's real. Yeah, so that is what actually, that is what happens. That means you can imagine, for example, the main church, what we call the home church, would be in one city. Uh, and then they would have, at that same time, um, churches in many other congregations in many other cities. Now, many times they would have a, they call them a campus pastor. So they would have a campus pastor in those places. But when uh, so and they may have a local worship team, so they'll all start worship at the same time. And exactly when the pastor starts preaching in the main church, he comes on the screen, he's on screen in all the other locations. So everybody's hearing the same message from the same pastor uh, in all these satellite churches. And you know, uh, there are big numbers, so that for whatever reason, people don't mind it. 
they're hearing the same message and these things are happening it's it's, it's going well you know so that was uh, that's uh, that's happening and some of them are even across continents and i think with technology some amazing things especially I, what i saw kingdom city church do during covid times you know they would actually have worship teams there'd be one worship team in australia one in malaysia one say some other part of the world three different worship teams different parts of the world and they blend the worship so it's amazing it was really amazing how they would do it with technology so anybody watching it's like as though these three teams are on the same stage but actually the three teams are in three different parts of the world uh, and but they're all it's through technology when they see on the screen it looks like they're all standing on the stage and people are worshiping you know in, the, in those auditoriums uh, they are all in different parts of the world but they're actually it seems like they are worshiping with the same worship team but it's actually in different parts of the world and uh, then the preacher preaches and it you know so amazing things are being done with the help of media and technology in the way the worship experience is happening but like uh, Divya pointed out we have to think about uh, you know uh, fellowship life-to-life uh, -life relationship all those you know the mentoring so on. Then, 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 then there are positive things you know like people who cannot go to church definitely benefit uh, so there are good things but there are also the other things to think about and then like john pointed out uh, in some cases i'm not saying it happens every time but in some cases the pastor becomes like a big celebrity you know and that kind of draws the crowd but also the attention is on one man you know so just a thought here one of the things that we decided you know when we in our own journey uh, as a church uh, you know we re when we were opening up our branch churches uh, we could have used technology that means just like what we're doing we, we could live stream from one location to the other and uh, you know tell people what's what's the main what's the service on screen etc we could do that but one of the things we made a decision and we had a lot of discussion you know within our pastoral team leaders and all that uh, we had discussions and we felt that we will not live stream the main service into other satellite locations other campuses instead every campus will have its own worship team, its own teams, its own pastor. We will preach the same message. We are sharing the same word, um, but each pastor is preaching and caring for the congregation. And, and we felt that doing this would help us nurture many, many pastors at the same time, because you know, you're know you actually doing the work, you're actually ministering, you're actually preaching. And, and so it will help us nurture many leaders it will also keep the attention off of one main pastor. Yes, there is a senior pastor who's leading us and all that, but uh, the attention is not on that one person. Every congregation has its own uh, pastor taking care of them. Only if it, we reach a point where there is a congregation, but we don't, we're not able to appoint a pastor, then okay, our next best option is okay to stream into that place. But that's only if we are not able to send uh, somebody physically to minister, then that is when we will use the you know the live stream. Also. Otherwise, let's send somebody physically. Let's have somebody physically ministering, because we look at it as an opportunity to nurture up uh, more and more leaders. And the more they preach and teach, the better they become. So that's kind of a decision we made. Uh, earlier on when we had these discussions when we saw other churches doing live stream and that was our approach uh, i'm not against our churches that are doing live streaming of satellite churches that's their choice it's fine we ch chose to take this approach and uh, which is what we are doing and following and we want to plant more churches but with real people who are pastoring and uh, leading those congregations a any other thoughts uh, on this on the gathering place and how things have changed what are the pros and cons yeah. one of the things that we have uh, that you know we've also seen um, 
Okay, so I see John Paul's comment. Uh, I think we should be careful about our conduct, our personality on screen, live stream, and real life. Yeah, so this should be consistent. Who we are on screen should be connected or should be the same as who we are off the screen. I think that's what John is telling. Yeah. Thank you, John. So what, what I wanted to say was one of the things that uh, we have seen is uh, um, is that in the in the case of where one pastor is being streamed into many satellite churches, if something happened to that one pastor, you know maybe there's a moral failure or something, it immediately impacts all the satellite churches immediately. And that has been observed uh, in, you know, in, 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 in these satellite churches. Uh, because everybody's listening to the same one pastor, all the churches are connected. While there's, there are benefits, the negative is if something happens here, every church, every satellite church is affected. It's very difficult. I'm not saying everything has to shut down. Uh, it's difficult to sustain once the impact has happened. So that's something to keep in mind. I see uh, Divya's comment. Um, uh, home church is also coming as a result of lack of in-person church services. Yes, so home churches are being established uh, wherever they're, you know, in-person churches, larger larger congregations would not arise. Home churches, yeah. Good. Okay. If there are no more comments, we will move to the next chapter. Anybody else want to say anything about this? Any observations? Any thoughts? Okay, let's move to the next chapter, which is how worship has changed uh, over time with you know, technology, media and technology, uh, and so on. So let's just think about it. And again, here we'll have a little discussion at the end. So if you follow worship, uh, starting from the Old Testament times on, in the Old Testament, obviously, you know, uh, one of the earliest recorded instances there with you know, after Israel, they, they crossed the Red Sea. They are prophesying, they're dancing with timbrel, or celebrating, worshiping God. And uh, then, of course, um, worship took place in the tabernacle. They would come and offer sacrifices. Then there was a physical building temple. Solomon's temple was built. And we see amazing, you know, worship happening. Um, especially uh, in the tabernacle and thereafter in the temple. When you in the tabernacle, David appointed musicians and singers, a uh, big number. He had, uh, I think he had about 200 some worship leaders, uh, musicians, several thousand singers and worshipers and people who pray. So especially in David's time in the tabernacle, Worship was happening, and you know, for 33 years it went on non-stop, 24/7 worship. So, and imagine all of that was happening without hymn books, without song books, without PowerPoint, without projection, nothing. It was happening. So think about it. A lot of it had to be spontaneous, uh, spirit-inspired worship, 24/7 worship and prayer going on in the tabernacle without any of these things that we have today. Um, we come into the New Testament, worship, we see worship again continuing in the synagogue, the early church. The Apostle Paul tells us, you know, to sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, sing and make melody in our heart to the Lord. So worship was uh, going on. A lot of it was very spontaneous um, without any of the things that we have today. And then, Formal church organ music around 700 AD. You know, the, the organ came in. Uh, then worship uh, with, the, with, the, with, the, with the Roman Catholic Church uh, became um, uh, a kind of a, it's referred to as a Gregorian chant where. Uh, the priest would say something, and the congregation would respond. So that kind of that kind of a responsive chant type of worship was 
going on around 800 AD in the, I mean, the Catholic Church. Then in the 15th, 1500s, 16th century, just right after the Reformation began, uh, Martin Luther, Calvin, um, they had their own opinions about congregational worship. Uh, uh, Martin Luther, uh, um, uh, one, uh, sorry, John John Calvin wanted to include words of the Bible, whereas um, Martin Luther wanted songs or hymns to reflect words of scripture. All right, so you're not exactly quoting words of the words of the Bible, but you're expressing what is in scripture. So the, the, they had those different positions, but both encouraged the writing of hymns um, that were very word focused. One wanted to use the actual words of the Bible. One said, it's okay to you know, represent what the Bible says or express what the Bible says, fine, fine. But the good thing was both wanted to keep the songs and the hymns focused on the word of God. And that gave birth to amazing hymns, which, you know, we, uh, many of the hymns we keep singing even today, which are so full of the word of God. And thank God for these people who emphasize that keep your hymns based on the word of God or include the word of God in your hymns. Um, the German composer, um, Johann Sebastian Bach, he was greatly influenced by Martin Luther, and he tried, very interesting, he tried to include scripture in his music. Yeah, so, uh, in his cantatas, he was given a task, imagine, to compose a cantata every week using Bible verses. That was his responsibility, uh, uh, using Bible, using scripture, compose a cantata for the Sunday service. And so music then became a, a, became a very powerful expression of scripture, which was very good, very good. You know, that the focus was on the word of God to be sung in hymns or put into music. In the revivals um, that took place, some of these were global movements, um, songs, uh, which would be choruses, a lot of small, small, simple choruses were being written. Uh, you know, uh, so so not just hymns. Now, were these are spiritual songs, song, song that that express what God was doing, uh, calling people to awaken, uh, and so on. Nineteen um, hundreds with the revivals that began to take place again, uh, both the Beersusa Street revival, the revival in Wales, and other parts of the world. We had a lot of gospel music, gospel choir happening, and so on. So all of what we can say is, till this point, a lot of it was scripture and song. But something shifted around the 1970s. And, uh, and yeah, so... You know, I'm not saying it was bad, but this is the change that happened. In the 1970s, uh, in, uh, in America, uh, especially on the West Coast, uh, uh, we, so what happened was there was a cultural revolution around that time, and there was the hippie movement. Uh, a lot of the young people got into drugs, and they just basically stepped, you know, stepped out of society, it was just, Again, society and so on. And, uh, um, but there was a move of God amongst those people and they got saved. So you can imagine people coming out of drugs and uh, the, the, the kind of music that was there, the rock and roll type music, coming out of that, getting saved. A pastor who was very in instrumental in reaching those people was Pastor Chuck Smith. Uh, who was, uh, you know, the founding pastor of Calvary Chapel. Calvary Chapel uh, spread around the U.S. But he, he, he was on the West Coast uh, of the United States, was reaching these people. These people got saved. And uh, eventually he formed, in, it, it all started in his house, and eventually he formed Calvary Chapel. But the thing was, these people 
who got saved. They couldn't, they didn't want to sing the hymns and the choruses that the church was singing up until that time. They wanted rock music, the drums, the guitar, and all of that. So it was in that situation where, you know, we had this Christian rock. So they brought that style of music into the church and they started writing songs that fit into that style of music. And uh, Christian rock music came into existence around that time. And uh, Pastor Chuck Smith welcomed it. The traditional churches would not welcome it. They would not accept drums and guitars and those kinds of instruments being played. And so now, of course, the logic there was Pastor Chuck Smith saying, hey, this is the way they like to worship. They want to sing, fine. As long as they're getting saved, they're coming out of the drugs and the hippie culture and they're coming to Jesus, it's fine. And uh, there was a man, Larry Norman, and you, you will find some of his uh, YouTube videos and songs that he wrote. You know, in one song he wrote, uh, Why Should the World Have All the Good Music? I think that was it. That was the title of the song. <laughs> the, whole, the whole thing was, uh, I mean, the Christian rock. You can listen to some of Larry Norman's song, but he's considered the pioneer of Christian rock. And you can listen to some of his songs. It's not necessarily, you know, chapter and verse. It's more of feelings. This is what I feel. And this is, you know, expression of ideas and thoughts in, in that very, 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 very um, vibrant type of music. Which, and some of it, you know, you could say, yeah, was expression of scripture, but not all of it. So there was a big shift that happened. And out of that, what we call as contemporary Christian music was formed or came out in the 1980s. Subsequently, Vineyard, Vineyard Churches, Vineyard Music uh, came out with their songs. But it's taking this whole move of Christian rock music to another level, trying to bring in writing contemporary songs, uh, expressing feelings and thoughts and of course there was some amount of the word and scripture uh, so on worship and so on then we have other you know songs that came out in the 1990s integrity hosanna hosanna integrity hill song other christian bands in the 2000s again lots and lots lots of different christian bands christian artists and so on so we've gone from Worship without any any support, no books, no hymn books, no Bibles, I mean, no song books. It was more spontaneous. We've gone from there to today where there is so much of, you know, instruments and uh, all, kinds of, all kinds of things that are happening in the music, Christian music world. Uh, where sometimes it almost seems like entertainment, like if you have these big concerts and all of that, stadiums are packed with thousands of people and uh, our Christian worship bands are performing. And sometimes it's genuine worship. Sometimes it seems like entertainment uh, with so much of instruments and all kinds of things involved lights and uh, screen and so on and uh, when you think about the words the content uh, you know you've gone from people like john calvin and martin luther who emphasized god's word to be put into song or put into music to today where sometimes you you wonder what is the word in this song uh, what is the theology in the song? Uh, you know, so we've got this this song. So I'm not saying everything is bad, but this is where we are. So we've got to think about this. You know, the contemporary Christian music. What is the good? What is the bad? What are the things we need to be careful of? Can be. Um, I know we just have about ten minutes. It may not be enough for discussion, but. Uh, I just want to open up and uh, let us share our thoughts on what we are seeing in the world of Christian worship, Christian music, 
uh, which is primarily to worship God. And of course, songs can encourage and edify one another, which the New Testament teaches us to do, to speak to one another, one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, to build each other up through song. But what are your thoughts? What are your reflections? What is good? What are things not good? What are things we have to be careful about? We just love to hear. Go ahead, Divya. Go ahead. Thank you, Pastor. Uh, yeah, yeah uh, yes, uh, we see like worship, uh, the style of worship, the content of the songs uh, all have changed over time. And um, uh, mainly I, I was thinking of uh, most like majority, I, I won't say the whole of it, but majority of the songs nowadays are uh, very feeling based, um, focus more on, uh, you know, the self rather than towards God. Uh, but there are, of course, good songs that uh, talk about the nature of God and have uh, scripture songs, um, uh, scripture into the songs. Uh, uh, yeah, so, uh, uh, yeah, I think that there is a, uh, there is a season in every, uh, every uh, 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 believer's life where they need uh, certain aspects of this but as we grow uh, I think uh, it's more of what Jesus was uh, saying in John 4 24 like uh, the worship uh, need to be in spirit and truth so uh, uh, more more of scripture and more of uh, uh, pointing towards God spiritual worship um, should be um, Something that uh, we need to, you know, do, the, that should be kind of a filter to uh, to know what kinds of songs uh, need, we need to listen to because uh, maybe the focus is not on the right places in some of those songs. Uh, so, yeah, so that, uh, we need to be careful because uh, what we hear influences us. Thank right, you. right. Good. Good. Anyone else? Um, I can share. Can they hear me? Yeah. So I just think that uh, worship should become ministry, the perspective of why they sing. Which, uh, I don't see sometimes it's not about just singing, just playing some random music and just doing it as a culture but uh, they should also understand that it's not just it's, it's a ministry it's it's the way we uh, serve God and uh, I, I also think cultural context must be taken care of in some of these things because uh, contemporary music uh, it just just depends on where we are worshiping sometimes so when I go back to my place uh, they still stick to hymns uh, they still uh, do that and in some churches they don't but uh, I think yeah that ultimately it's all about being led by the spirit not support or the hymns or the contemporary ones but it's good to take uh, just to have a little look on how people have been built all these days uh, and to just uh, help them to grow in that way suddenly if you I've seen people uh, come to the church and suddenly they start singing the contemporary songs people get offended by it people they feel like it's it's not right it's you're going in the way of the world uh, we can help them understand uh, slowly little by little through the teaching that it's not like that but uh, I think sometimes it's better to take the cultural even into context because uh, we don't want people to speak something different uh, through the time while we are, while our intentions are to make them worship God, and even the hymns are good, uh, the the lyrics they have written are, are actually good, but sometimes I feel like even hymns become just like uh, an order of the church. 
love not like especially for ministry time it just becomes a pattern that the church follows like four hymns a day when we start when we end there's a hymn and then in between two hymns for the offering and then and then that's it that's that's what they consider as uh, a worship time so um that's i think the intention the motive has to be right that's what that's what i believe there there should be a vision even for uh, the people who are in the in the worship team in the worship ministry uh, that the time should be a time where they get the people get closer to god that's what uh, i i believe yeah thank you thank you okay um, I see John Paul's comments, uh, the pros, they're able to worship freely. Uh, some songs come from a place of revelation from God's word, which edifies the church, wonderful. Some of the negatives, sometimes we move away from God's word and yeah, like this, just become focused on emotions. Uh, sometimes the focus is on winning awards, <laughs> creating celebrities. Sometimes uh, the lights and the smoke, the production itself, yeah, it takes away the heart of the ship. True, true. These are true, valid things, you know, valid points, which uh, we have to be careful of today, you know, because we've got all the media and all of this thing, which are tools for us to use, uh, but we cannot let these tools, lights and media and the production, cannot make that the focus. Worship is towards God. We glorify God. It should be based on scripture. It should enable us to express our heart. And yes, there is feeling involved. There is emotion. And it should also edify when it's directed towards others. Yeah, edify other believers as well. So I think we, you know, while we are grateful to God for, you know, all that we enjoy today in terms of media and technology and the contemporary expressions. One, we don't want to lose the beautiful hymns, the wonderful hymns that were written time, time passed, but because they were based on the word, they continue. They're still very valuable. We still sing them. We shouldn't lose that. And we must also keep our focus that worship is for God, unto God. And uh, we shouldn't get distracted by all this, all these other things that happen uh, when we use the tools that we have, right? So, um, as we journey forward, you know, we must be aware. Uh, nowadays, uh, we can, uh, you know, you can go to uh, AI tools and tell it to write a song and write a song for you in <laughs> in a minute. You say, write a song about this, and it'll write uh, a song. You know, you can go to chat GPT and tell it. So that's another big issue now. You know, who's going to write the song? Is it a person inspired by the Holy Spirit? Or is it some AI tool that can write songs and DVS is even sermons and all that? So uh, we have to, you know, be, God has called us to worship him. Uh, tools are there. Tools are there. Yeah, yeah. people have access to tools. But we should know when and how to use them correctly without losing focus. Okay, let's pause here for today. Thank you for participating. Thank you for sharing your thoughts. We'll pick things up next week, move forward. Could somebody please close in prayer and then we will dismiss. Let's, let's pray. pray. Father Almighty God, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for today. We thank you for, for your word. We thank you for these lessons that have made us to learn a lot about worship, Father King of Glory. As we move into the new era, Father, soak all the instruments that we shall be using in churches, Lord God, so that we are not diverted from the true worship and into the worships of idol, into worship for emotion and self and, and promotion of the self. We pray that let your Holy Spirit be the one always to guide us. We pray and declare all this in Jesus' name we have prayed. Amen. 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 Thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful rest of the day. I'll connect again. So God bless. Bye now.